morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in my talk, uh, I'll be talking about uh, structural fatigue of superelastic nickel titanium wires uh, when, when loadings uh, actually approach the regime of uh, stress induced Martin's detector transformation. Uh, this morning uh, thank you this uh, thanks to this uh, martin civic transformation actually the the, the, the super elastic wires uh, can can recover large strains of several persons uh, as it is well seen on this typical uh, stress strain curve of a super elastic wire where you uh, spot uh, the plateau stress at, at which the, the martin civic transformation is actually uh, induced within the current austenite phase and these large strains uh, appear. Well, this functional property is actually used in medical devices and uh, in these devices of course the, 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 uh, the fatigue properties are, are critical. But uh, unfortunately, as reported by many many authors, the, the fatigue properties actually drop down to, to low cycle fatigue whenever these large strains are cyclically induced uh, in the wire. Uh, but actually, well, because the functional property is linked to strains, the fatigue properties are often uh, like interpreted in terms of uh, amplitudes of, of strains. But actually, it is not uh, straightforward to, to identify the fatigue properties in intermediate strains. And and why? Well, it's because in straight super elastic wires the transformation actually proceeds in, in, a, in a localized way. Meaning that the martensite is nucleated somewhere in the wire, most often in grips. And it is nucleated actually in fully stretched uh, strain state. And then uh, this martensite is propagated throughout the, the, the whole wire. So it is indeed uh, difficult to identify fatigue properties in intermediate strains between uh, elastic austenite and fully stretched uh, martensite. And for this reason, uh, we decided to, to do fatigue testing on, on, on samples made from super elastic wires, but processed into this uh, hourglass uh, shape. Uh, in fact, this shape makes uh, the, say, the transformation strains uh, to appear continuously along the uh, straining of, of the of the of the sample, as you see on this on this movie showing the digital image correlation, the the, the strain field in the middle of the uh, hourglass shape, and you see the typical tensile curve of this sample as measured with extensometer surrounding the hourglass shape, and in terms of local strains in in, in here. Oh, for the samples. Yeah. We, actually, we actually used uh, uh, thicker, thicker wires, of course, to be able to process it into this shape. We used the, uh, the, the wires of, of 1.78 millimeters and provided by Fort Wayne Metals in, in, in uh, uh, S-drone state. Then we process the samples and then we, we uh, uh, perform the final heat treatment. Now, we did this thing in, in two temperatures. Why? It's because the tensile properties are uh, uh, strongly dependent on temperature. So we tested at, eight, at 40 and 80 degrees C. Actually, at 80 degrees C, the plateau stress inducing the martens transformation is much higher by 300 MPa. And the second thing that is affected by the temperature is, okay, is the, the disappearance or disappearance, let's say, of the R phase transformation that always appears in, in super elastic wires before the Martin Zee transformation. And actually, so at 80 degrees C it is suppressed, but at 40 degrees C it proceeds and it, it, it uh, makes, in fact, the material softer. At, at early stages of straining, as you can see on this evolution of young models with, with, uh, with stresses. 
Now, the testing was done in, in force control uh, regime at uh, 25 Hz and, and loading ratio 0.1. And the, the runout run limit we set to, to 1.5 million millions of, uh, of cycles. So now let's go directly to you, the results. For, at 40 degrees C, we, we measured the fatigue limits at uh, 400 MPa, being well below the Martensic transformation. And surprisingly, at 40 degrees C, we measured uh, the fatigue limit at uh, 550 MPa, being well higher above the, 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 the test at, uh, uh, the, at 40 degrees C. But, but in, in both the cases, let's say, the, the, the fatigue performance drops down to load cycle fatigue at, at uh, stresses that are, again, below the Martensitic transformation plateau stress. Now, okay, because strains are important property of these wires, we converted, in fact, the, the, these fatigue curves into, into local strain in the, the mid-cross section of the uh, hourglass shape. Here, in terms of fatigue limit, the situation is the same, again, at 80 degrees C, the material performs better, but the fatigue limit is, again, at very low, low strains, at 0.7, okay? And at 40 degrees C, it is at 0.5%, but uh, the situation changes when the strains are actually higher than 1%. And it's, uh, it's uh, most probably because of the appearance of R phase at, at, uh, at 40 degrees C, right? because the R phase make the material softer and so it relieves actually the stresses compared to elastic deformation at 80 degrees C where we reach uh, very high stresses compared to this uh, 40 degrees C. So we have got uh, in fact uh, different, let's say, fatigue performance at 80 and 40 degrees and uh, now there are two possible effects that can cause this, this, this change. Uh, it's either the, the fact that at 80 degrees C the R phase is suppressed or it might be the effect of the changing plateau stress uh, of the Martensity transformation. Well, to at least try to answer this question, uh, uh, we, we looked at, uh, at fatigue damage caused by the fatigue testing. Uh, and uh, thank you. Now let's, let's look at uh, uh, fatigue uh, crack surfaces. First thing to notice, of course, the fatigue crack is uh, scales with number of cycles. So the, the lower the number of cycles, the, 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 lower of the, the lower the size of the fatigue crack. Second thing is that inversely, overload surface uh, scales with peak of nominal stresses. It actually scales linearly. Right? And now we calculated the we calculated actually the normal stresses and at the reduced uh, surface areas. And uh, surprisingly, uh, well, surprisingly, uh, simply the normal stresses were above the, the, the limits for Martensitic <coughs> transformation, above the plateau stress. So, which means that most probably at the end of fatigue cycling, before the final fracture, the Martensitic transformation actually proceeds in the in the in the sample, although the nominal loadings were well were below the, the Martensity transformation regime, and uh, to check this, uh, we used uh, thermography, we used uh, infrared camera that can actually spot the, the phase transformation through the identification of latent heat. Uh, well. For simple introduction, we see heating whenever the, the, the forward transformation from austenite or R phase, uh, from austenite to R phase or to martensite proceeds, and we see cooling uh, upon reverse transformation back to the austenite. This is the, the typical picture for the virgin sample, nominally loaded in this R phase transformation regime. And when we look at the sample, just a few cycles before the rupture, uh, we see uh, much more intensive and localized uh, heating cooling uh, within the within the sample that, that is periodically appearing with the with the loading. It suggests so that the, the, the Martensic transformation proceeds, 
But if the Martin Dirac transformation proceeds, there, there must be also higher strains. And so we looked at the, uh, at the elongation recorded by the extensometer. And indeed, what we found out is that in last, let's say, 100 cycles before final rupture, we have an increase in this, in this elongation. And moreover, we have an increase in, in, uh, in hysteresis. And hysteresis is, again, an inherent property of the, of the, of the martensitic transformation. So we could, in fact, use this, this increase as an alert uh, of, the, of the fatigue failure. And we used it to arrest uh, the fatigue test at this at this uh, at this, uh, this stage of final fatigue, and what we did is that we stretched the, the sample up to complete rupture, and we recorded the crack opening, and and we actually measured that when reaching a plateau stress, actually the, the crack opening uh, the crack can open with without further increase of the resistance, huh? as, as indicated by, by by this plateau. So we can conclude that indeed that at the final stage of overload the, 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 the martensitic transformation that can occur because the reduction of the, of the remaining uh, cross-section is so high that, that, nominal, that normal stress reaches the, 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 is above actually the plateau stress for the martensitic transformation and, and, and in this stage really the martensitic transformation assists in, in, in in, in fast crack growth that, that grows right in, 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 uh, in, uh, in ductile manner, let's say. But now, let's look uh, more in the history of this test. And, and in fact, we could spot it, uh, we could spot the localized uh, heating cooling sources well before the final rupture. In this case, uh, it was actually in, in two-thirds of the fatigue life. Huh? And, and we, we spotted this localized uh, heating cooling source that appeared, that appeared periodically with the, with the loading and the intensity was increasing with, with the cycling. And we actually believe this, in this stage, in fact, uh, a crack, a large crack already uh, is within the, within the, within the cross-section and uh, actually the martensitic transformation proceeds in the, in the, in the, in the crack tip, let's say. And, and uh, maybe this, or we think that this, this at this stage, again, uh, these, these, these uh, uh, let's say, uh, this typical fracture surface appear, this typical fracture containing the, 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 the striation is, is just created during this stage. But, but actually, the Fatigue crack initiation and the early propagation is actually uh, done without any macroscopic uh, martensitic transformation. And, and, and the, the, the fracture surface is actually uh, has, has uh, classic cleavage, let's say, uh, features, as you can see. So I'm coming to conclusions. Uh, from our measurement, we can say that early crack nucleation and doesn't need uh, martensitic transformation when the, 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 the fatigue limits are, are, are reached uh, and these fatigue limits, uh, fatigue limits were actually identified at 40, 400 MPA and, and 550 MPA. But once the crack is nucleated, one it, once it reaches the, the when it reached the critical size, actually the martensitic transformation is triggered in the cross in the at the crack tip and it actively assists in, in the in the next crack growth. Mm -hmm. And last last conclusion is that actually if we want really to study uh, the effect of martensitic transformation on the crack crack growth and on the crack nucleation, we actually have to go for for, for wires having the plateau stress below these basic uh, structural fatigue. Okay, thank you for your attention.